All right, so here is the week eight uh, recap video. So this week eight uh, was all about deontology. And deontology is a moral perspective that essentially says you ought to do certain things. It's very much based on duty. There's certain things that are right no matter what, and certain things that are wrong no matter what. And your obligation is simply to fulfill those, um, uh, those actions, those characteristics, those behaviors. So when we talk about um, deontology and, and the Kantian, uh, because we're going to study deontology through Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant was a huge, important, a massive figure uh, philosophically. He was a German in the uh, 18th century, and uh, he produced works in metaphysics and ethics uh, that really have shaped philosophy and Western society more generally. Uh, so brilliant guy. And... Um, what we're talking about here with his deontological perspective uh, is that it is um, an action to be moral has to be based on duty, not on your desire. Uh, he's very much against this idea of calling something based on desire moral. Um, it's either immoral or amoral. In other words, not moral or immoral. Uh, it's just not kind of in that category. And he's very much against it because desires are variable. They're inconsistent. They uh, They change by persons individually or by cultures, and so what one person or what one culture desires is not necessarily what another person or another culture desires, nor um, are our desires consistent within ourselves. You know, at one minute we might uh, desire something, another minute we might not. Um, you know, think about it being in a relationship. One minute you might be uh, head over heels uh, in love with this person. Uh, the next minute you may want to say, look, you know, um, I'm out, forget it, that's it. Uh, so if we were to base uh, our actions on desires, then they would only be accidentally moral. In other words, sometimes our desires may lead us to the moral um, position, other times they may not. And that for Kant is not good enough. That's not a, a valid ethical basis. So, some things are fundamentally right, some things are fundamentally wrong. Why is that the case? Well, essentially that goes to his categorical imperative. And that's where he says uh, an action to be moral has to pass two tests. One is the principle of universality, where you essentially take your action and you say, what if everybody else did this? Would it remain consistent and coherent? And the other test is this idea of treating people as ends, not means. In other words, when I treat a rational creature as a means, I'm viewing them fundamentally in terms of what use I have for them. You know, are they useful to me? That's their value. Whereas treating them as ends means that they are fundamentally valuable regardless of whether I can get something from them or, or not. Um, so those are the two things that, uh, you know, really make something right. So, for example, lying will be wrong. Uh, it uses someone as a means. In other words, I lie to you, I deceive you because I want to get something from you. And it also breaks that principle of universality because I lie when I want to get something from you. If everyone followed that rule, no one could trust each other's utterances. Uh, communication would break down. And we wouldn't get anything by lying because nobody would, would trust us. So if everybody followed our logic, we wouldn't get what we want. Um, now, you know, a deontological, um, in a certain sense, absolutist perspective that Kant adopts uh, does raise some objections. You know, would you lie in order to save uh, your child's life or something like that? Uh, and Kant says, look, if it's wrong, it's wrong no matter what. Uh, and many people do have um, issues with that. And I just want to mention one thing about the um, this universality. There is a sense of consistency there. I mean, this is one of the big kind of selling points. Intuitively, uh, there seems to be something right about that. And the consistency is, look, I can't say, I want to do this for me, but I don't want you to do it. That inconsistency, that form of egotism, uh, is going to be viewed by Kant as, as wrong. And so Kant is fundamentally a guy who is against uh, an egotistic perspective. Okay, and so now to focus a little bit more on the goodwill, the principle of the goodwill. You guys wrote about this uh, in your discussion boards. And the idea here is that the only person who is truly moral is the person who does what is right because it's, uh, for no other reason than it is right. That's it. If you do it because it makes you happy, if you do it because you desire it, 
if you do it because uh, there'll be good consequences for you or somebody else, then you are not acting morally. It doesn't mean you're necessarily being an immoral person. It means that you might be amoral. You know, you're kind of neither moral or immoral. Like if I want to get a black raspberry ice cream cone, you know, that doesn't necessarily make me moral or, or immoral. It could just be a non-moral choice, an amoral choice. But if I want to be considered moral, if I want to think that my actions uh, are, are actually good uh, in a moral sense, well, then I have to abide by this idea that I have to choose what I choose for no other reason than it's right. Uh, there's some people that disagreed with this. Some people that essentially said, look, I need to find my passion. A person needs to find their passion. Uh, they are not, no good. They're not worth anything. They can't contribute to society if they don't find that passion. You know, so if we're not driven by something that we love to do. Um, and so that's a good point. I mean, it's a very, you know, valid idea. Um, Kant would necessarily disagree with this in the sense if you want to find your career or, or something like that or, or your vocation. But in terms of, you know, within that career, within that vocation, uh, what ought you to do? What are your duties? Those uh, should not be driven by passion. Um, because, again, passions can change. Passions could lead you to places that hurt or harm or um, do things that violate the moral principle. Another um, point that a lot of people made, and this is a really interesting point, was that this complete devotion to the moral law will burn yourself out. And, um, you know, that uh, is wrong. You know, you shouldn't be totally devoted to others because you just can't handle it. Um, and I think Kant actually might agree with this in the sense that um, he would say, look, is it wrong for you to devote some time to yourself? Is it wrong for you to be healthy? Uh, and I don't think Kant is going to disagree with that. Because look at the flip side. If you totally devote yourself to others, if, you, if all of your life is for the good of others, for the desires of others, for the needs of others, for the well-being of others, then essentially what you do is you use your own life. You use yourself simply to provide well-being for others. And Kant is going to say nobody should be used, including yourself. So I think there is a space for Kant, uh, certainly to say that healthy living is, is acceptable. Again, he's not going to, to agree that you, know, you should be focused on yourself, that you should be self-absorbed, that you should act in a way that you want to act but not others. You know, that kind of egotism is wrong. But a healthy uh, living is certainly compatible with a Kantian morality. Uh, so it's important to notice. Um, those that agreed with Kant said some interesting things as well. They said, look, you know, you shouldn't be focused on getting something. And when you base your action on desire or the good consequences, it really becomes about getting something from it. And uh, a number of you said, look, that, there's something wrong with that. A number of you also mentioned this idea that we I previously talked about, that happiness is variable, it changes, it's inconsistent from person to person or even within people. Uh, you know, what makes people happy is not always uh, the same. Uh, and then finally, and this is a really, really important point that I just want to point out, Kant is not saying that you can never be happy. What he is saying is that you should not make happiness the basis of your moral decisions. So if doing something moral makes you happy, that's great. That's like a nice bonus for Kant. Um, but it should never be the reason that you do what you do. So if you become happy because uh, you're a good student and you're going to class and that's what you're supposed to do, that for Kant, okay, that's great, wonderful. But it should never be the reason, happiness, for going to class. You should go to class because that's what you ought to do. That's what you're supposed to do as a student. Okay, and the final discussion board was about this idea of utilitarianism and Kant. And um, a number of you mentioned this idea that, look, utilitarianism allows uh, room for personal happiness and interests, whereas Kant does not. Um, now, it's not quite the case, as we've already mentioned, for Kant, because, you know, essentially what he's going to say is, look, to follow the moral laws, do your moral duty, um, but there are certain areas in life that are uh, amoral, um, that it's not necessarily bad to have passions or hobbies as long as that doesn't interfere with your moral duty. If your moral duty says to do something and your passions, your hobbies get in the way, then the moral duty comes first. So there could certainly be room for some of this in, in Kantian philosophy. He just wouldn't call it the moral uh, area of your life.
And again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the immoral. It doesn't necessarily mean you're being bad. Uh, it could just mean that you're being amoral. Um, and again, uh, you know, for Kant, being selfish would be immoral. You know, just focused on yourself, certainly. Um, but on the other hand, healthy living could be okay. Uh, a number of you mentioned this, that, you know, look, there's certain things for Kant that are off-limits no matter what, whereas utilitarianism, nothing is fundamentally off-limits. As long as it produces happiness, a net gain of happiness, then the action can be considered good. And that is a big difference between Kant and utilitarianism. For Kant, you know, look, if murdering somebody would produce more happiness in the end, then your duty is to murder that person. Um, okay, so that's the difference. And again, though, uh, it should be really clear that Kant is against self-absorption and egotism. And uh, with that, uh, we move on this week to week nine, natural law morality.